Yeah, yeah public Wi-Fi is a little slow. Is it the Wi-Fi here? Yeah. Okay. Well, and that's not that's not a shiny new computer. No, this one isn't. But <laughs> that's all right. I mean, okay. Uh, are you okay with me kind of introducing or talking, or you want to? You can you can start whenever you like. Okay. I got I got three or four more minutes. I probably need to okay. um, to to get this set up, but. Um, Oh, yeah. All right, we're going to go ahead and get going um, as Mr. Wandro tries to get my ancient laptop to wake up a little bit. So, nonprofit life, right? Hi, everybody. Um, uh, I'm Gail Brubaker. I'm the executive director for the West Des Moines Historical Society. And I am proud to launch the second in our series of Iowa Files. This is the fourth year for it. We do this in partnership with the West Des Moines Public Library, EMC Insurance Foundation, the Iowa Arts Council, and members and donors like you. So if you like what we do, please think about throwing a buck or two in the plastic box in the back. Um, our presenter today is somebody who has a fantasy job, I think, for a lot of us, especially my husband. He gets to design and play on golf courses, and he gets paid to do it. So how awesome would that be? That would be like me being a professional champagne taster and dog and cat cuddler. So um, Mr. Wandro is a golf course builder, architect, and consultant. He is based here in Iowa. He works for Red Sox Golf Design and and Brian Schneider. He's currently building the highly anticipated Lido and Sedge Valley courses in the Sand Valley Golf Resort in central Wisconsin. Other efforts include consulting work at clubs in Illinois and Wisconsin. Joe spends his free time playing classical music and studying golf history. So, did you know that Waveland is the oldest municipal golf course west of the Mississippi? It has a very storied hat. Um, my husband plays on it as often as he can and says the hills will kill you. So, um, Mr. Wandro, if you are ready to start, please go right ahead. Yes, yes. Um, can you help me get this uh, of course. Um, up on the screen? Yes. It is the first. Um, it is. Yep. Settings. You want to talk about yourself a little bit while I try to work on settings? Yeah. Um, can I answer any questions before I start talking about Waveland Golf Course? Yeah, so I grew up in Des Moines and I played at Roosevelt High School. So that was our home course. Yeah. Um, yeah, I probably played 500 to 1,000 rounds there and kind of got obsessed in why certain things looked out of place and certain things didn't make sense to me as a golf course, just how it flowed, how um, there seemed to be a mixed match of styles on some of the greens, um, some of the layouts of different holes. So that kind of got me started down the rabbit hole. Tried to make a, um, a proposal for the city to make some changes. That didn't go anywhere. But um, yeah, now I work in the business and have a little bit more perspective on what's actually going on and what, what has changed on the golf course. How many of the golf courses have an observatory on them? None that I know of. None that I know of. Um, yeah, that was a joint 
um, Drake University in the city of Des Moines in 1924 um, erected that, and yeah, it's still in use. I think Drake is doing a big um, renovation of it. They're spending a few million dollars to bring it up to speed. Um, I, I like their weekly lectures. Sorry? Weekly lectures in the summertime. Do they have lectures there? Yeah. Nice. At night, so you can use the scope. <coughs> Did you use the Wayland golf course when you were in high school? Yep, that was our home course. I mean, it was four or five blocks from Roosevelt, so you just go around the corner on Polk and it was really easy, and I definitely fell in love with it. Um, we played every day after school. Um, golf season is August, September, so yeah, every day I'd be out, be out there after school. Um, Did you work there? I never worked there. Um, no, I never worked there. I worked at a, a club called The Harvester that's in, it's in Rhodes, Iowa, but near Marshalltown. I cut grass there. and raked bunkers there, which was really fun. Did you get the um, not as much as I would have liked to there, but. Uh. Yeah, well, this is nothing to do with golf, but um, I went to Roseville and yeah. we had our um, class reunions there. Yeah. And we've done that several times. And it's been wonderful with the club, yeah. with the clubhouse. And yeah, they've done a good job, I think, preserving a lot of the interior of the clubhouse. Yeah, because um, the clubhouse was, well, I mean, it was adequate for us to yeah. have a sit-down dinner. And yeah. It was very nice. I think it should be protected more. It's not on a historical society, and it's not, there's a, um, a WPA, New, Work, New Deal um, database of New Deal um, construction and projects, and that that federal program protects some buildings from being changed, but as far as I know, Waveland or the, the clubhouse at Waveland doesn't have any historical protection right now. I was trying to even um, think if we had golf clubs back when I graduated. <laughs> this is pretty. I, I could work with this. I think okay. if we got. I, I'm not sure if I'm, um, I'm trying to get it to forward. Yeah, we just need it. But here's a picture from, I think around 1934. So this is looking south west. You can see the observatory in the distance right there. And these are men with um, wheelbarrows, shovels. Looks like they're digging irrigation or um, drainage. Um, kind of in the, the big valley right, right below the clubhouse. Um, but they're digging it by hand and with wheelbarrows, which is pretty cool. Sorry, um, loading your slideshow. Is that where the water is? Yeah, um, that retention pond is, um, it's always been there, I think. Um, it was expanded in the 30s. Uh, lots, a lot of the infrastructure at Waveland dates back to the late 30s. Um, yeah, all the, all the big drains were built in the 30s. And you can, you can go look at them and they did, but they got the job done. Um, yeah, um, that's probably the first time I'd ever been there um, as a 10-year-old or 11-year-old. Um, perfect. We got it. All right. Well, uh, it's bad. How many college degrees does it take to figure out a laptop? <laughs> okay. For me, a lot. <laughs> me too. All right, well, this loads. I'll try to walk through... Um, Kind of the structure of my presentation is, oh, that's not going to work. Let's see. So I identify three big eras I'm going to talk about in Waveland's history, the Victorian era, which I, this is a disputed date range, but I'm going to call it um, 18, 1892. 1915, I'm going to call it the Victorian era of Waveland. Um, the second era, I put 19, 1915 to 1925 to 1965, and I call that the Great Depression and golf's golden age. Um, that's where we get most of what we have at Waveland today. It was in that golden age of golf. And then the last section I'll talk about, last time period, is basically about the interstate. It's the interstate comes to the golf course and everything changes. Um, and I, 
I think of that as Wayland's decline because the course has gotten worse in my view um, in that time period. Um, before we talk about any of the time periods, let's just kind of orient ourselves in the land. Um, 190 acres, I've seen reports that the city bought it. I've seen reports that it was donated. I don't know which, which is true. The, um, the city takes control about 1890. Um, they're looking at building a military base there, they never do, or military training grounds, they never do. Um, so it's just a kind of an open pasture park for the first um, 10 years. And then golfers decide, hey, we wanna, we wanna use this. Um, but so I, had, I wasn't talking about the land. Um, so the city of Des Moines sits kind of, um, I, I think of it as kind of a high prairie. It's, uh, about 960 feet above sea level. Um, but then the city falls away down to the river valleys. You have the Des Moines River and the Raccoon River. So Waveland kind of bridges the high prairie down to Walnut Creek, Raccoon River. Um, so you see in the corner, it's about 960 feet. And by, uh, by the time you get down by 56th Street, you've gone about 100 feet down. So when we're talking about Waveland and the big hills, we're, we're talking about 100 foot relief. Um, which is big. Um, and I had a, I have a, um, a coworker who didn't know anything about Waveland, but he's like, oh yeah, he's from Kentucky. And he's like, oh yeah, Waveland's one of those washboard, washboard hills courses. I don't know how he knew that, but he was right. Um, the purple. So I did outline, um, kind of the watershed. So we talked about the creek earlier that runs into like a big retention pond. So the red represent the low points in the watershed and the green, it's really faint with, um, with this light, but they represent the high points. I thought that might be interesting to see how little flat land there is. No, no, it's okay. Um, yeah, but you can see, this is a topographical map and you can see the washboard effect in the land. I mean, it's just, it's been eroded away down to the Walnut Creek Valley. All right. So, oops, I got to click this. The first period of Waveland's history I call Victorian. Um, Sorry for the technical difficulties. That might take a while to load. Well, that loads. I have an interview I want to play for you about early golf and what, what it might have been like to play really early Victorian golf. You can see a picture here. Um, there's not much to it. I call it in the next slide a big game of croquet. I mean, you're not hitting the ball very far. The balls were not standardized or uh, they weren't made of rubber or um, a sturdy material yet. They were still stuffed, so they didn't go very far. They're using hickory shafted clubs. Um, and they're playing on really rough golf courses that probably just mown circles in the, in the pasture. Um, let's see if this um, interview pops up here. Seven thirty. There it is. I'm just a green, for example. Oh. I'm already upset. When I find my ball in the bunker, I'm really upset. Seven thirty here. So they're going to talk a little bit about, um, yeah, this early idea of golf. What is, what does a, a really rudimentary golf in the United States look like? And who are the people playing it? Were you a factor in American culture that led to the rise of the golf club as a country club? Oh. Um, what were kind of those? And I should say, in this interview, they're talking about early country clubs, but you can what you can roll Waveland into that. It wasn't a different a different kind of golf being played at the country clubs at that point. So you could they're going to talk about country clubs, and you can just put 
municipal golf in there as well because it looked the same. So the impulse is to drove people to want to participate in, in something like this. Well, I think that there, there are a number of them and they're, they're sort of, it's, it's hard to arrange it by importance. But health is an important one. That um, the cities of the late 19th century were pretty ghastly places. Again, hard for us to imagine. Their disease was uh, much more common. Uh, and there was certainly the idea that uh, you wanted to uh, participate horses and carriages and stuff. There are all kinds of subtle and influences. But it was also, and a lot of historians have talked about this, it was a time when everybody was forming clubs for everything. There was a lot of, and, and a lot of associations. One, I think that somebody's used the phrase in the era of association. I think the, uh, the bar associations all are formed as the American Medical Association was formed during this period. All, all kinds of, I think the Boy Scouts were formed during this period. And so the idea that you could improve your life by being in these associations. They could provide clubhouses and they could provide events. One suspects they could provide romance. Men and women met one another. And if you look at the individual towns, um, I know that a, a student of mine wrote a really All good right. paper. On I'll stop that. And then I'm going to jump forward a little bit in this interview. But what they're talking about is, I mean, what, were they, what was driving people to play golf? And I think he makes it pretty clear that people just wanted to be outside, escape city life. Um, and hobbyists and people who liked club life, club social life, um, um, this was the time for them. And they formed a lot of these different associations to keep their social lives busy. And that was very, that was very much in vogue at that time. Um, I'm gonna jump forward to the interview. 2730. Couple of things. One is that it was Scottish. Now whether it was or not, uh, you know, you could you could uh, but Scott standard Scottish were, were just deemed to be acceptable. Then I think it had the allure that anybody could play the game. That he didn't have to be a big male. He didn't have to be fast. And I think it was, I think it's really good, good question. Is it, is it benefits a little bit from uh, being totally nonviolent? Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I've played golf for 70 years. I doubt you could tell me a sport that I could play for 70 years. I'm certainly not going to play football for 70 years or baseball or basketball or, or hockey. So the important point he's making here is that golf is, is inherently different than other sports. Um, and it provided this option if you didn't want to play a violent sport at that time period, it was an attractive um, option you could switch to. So as I kind of talked about, it's a big game of croquet. Um, physical characteristics of how they were playing the game. They had hickory, these are hickory shafted clubs. Um, the ball doesn't go very far. The courses are much shorter. Um, I don't know if you guys know specifics of golf hole lengths, but today a, a par four might be 400. Back then they were playing par fours at 270. So not half the size, but Certainly not um, up to today's standards of how far the ball goes today. Um, other Victorian golf courses you could investigate in Iowa are Algona Country Club, Elmwood Country Club, and Marshalltown. And then a really interesting one is on the east side of Des Moines um, called Grandview. It was built a year after Waveland, and it has not changed at all. So you can go there and still the holes are 270, 300 yards long. That's the same golf course. I don't think there's been any major changes um, to that golf course in 120 years. So that's an interesting place to see what Victorian golf looked like. Um, 
so Waveland is special. Um, like Gail mentioned, um, it was the first muni west of the Mississippi. But even more importantly, it was the third municipal course in the United States. So there was one in um, Boston, there was one in Detroit, and Waveland was third. It seems like kind of an aberration, but um, other interesting things, the golf was free for at least the first 10 or 15 years. There was no cost to play. Um, and then it was laid out. You could call me architect. I don't know that there was much design done. It was just laying out where the holes would go. Um, it was done by Warren Dickinson, who was an engineer in Des Moines. Um, and he was a prominent member of the, the first Des Moines Country Club, which was directly south of Waveland today. If you go back um, on the streets south of the interstate, um, you'll see Country Club Boulevard and you'll see references to a country club, but there's no golf, it's just a neighborhood. Um, and that's because Des Moines Golf was originally directly south of Waveland. Um, keep going here. So here's some early pictures, they're not great. Um, this is in the 20s because the observatory was built in 1924, but certainly a lot less trees on the golf course. It was a pasture. Um, yeah, I think this might have been this might have been in the winter or something. Um, but you can see it's very rudimentary. There's not pristine fairways or even pristine greens at this point, even in the 20s. Um, do a few more. That's the observatory. Yeah. Okay. And they didn't start moving west until early early fifties. Yeah, I have some. West, I have some maps that show the the growth. Is being developed when everything was on the east side. I think it was just either it was donated or the city got a good price for it. Because you think of how far they traveled to get. I mean, when you think of the east side, yeah. everything was by Drake and that. Yep. So they have to travel that distance. Well, this is very close to Drake. Yeah. It's only maybe 10 city blocks from Drake, yeah. so it's not far. Um, here's another early picture. Um, no golf carts yet, which is nice. Um, but it's, it's an open pasture at this point. And here's a later picture where the trees start coming in. And there's a very early picture. I don't even know what hole that is. I can't, I can't figure it out, but um, this looks like they were in construction in this picture. And that's the ninth hole today, which really hasn't changed at all. Um, so this was the first um, clubhouse. Um, they call it Waveland Golf Club because there was a club at the golf course, but it wasn't a, a club golf course, if that makes sense. It wasn't a country club, but there was a golfing club that held events at Waveland. So they wanted to build a clubhouse. This was their design. And it looks to me like they built the half size of their design or something. I don't, I'm not sure why. I couldn't find any information about a lack of funds or something, but it looks like it, about half the size of the plans. Um, and this would have been very near to where the tennis courts are today, if you know that area, um, right on the eastern boundary of the golf course. Um, keep going here. So here's a map someone drew of the course in the 20s. And there's some interesting things to point out. You see a picnic grounds. Um, so my hunch is, and I think this is kind of what they're getting to in that interview is people just wanted to be outside. And this idea that you had a, a golf course that was just there for golf didn't make sense yet. Or golf was something you did at the park almost. So the line between being out and camping and golfing might, have not, might not have been very um, delineated. You could have gone from, um, taking a stroll to playing one hole to going back to your walk. I don't think it was um, uh, 
very rigid, I should say. Um, but another interesting thing is there are 27 holes in this early design or early layout. Um, this, this is 56th Street today. Up here is University. And they had a road that bisected and then went up the north side. So there were roads going through the golf course. You had a beginner's course, which is interesting, of nine holes. Um, and then you had a full 18 set around those beginner holes. Um, yeah. So I think in the diagram, they're thinking that the, the T boxes are these straight lines against the long line, and then the, the greens are the squares. But some of them then are around too. And then some of them have two greens. So I haven't figured out everything in this, but um, I think it's interesting. And then if you want to kind of get a sense of what the clubhouse or meeting grounds look like, if we go back one slide, you can see pavilion. There's a pavilion there, and I think the clubhouse is right here. And that would have been kind of where the synagogue is today, um, near Polk Boulevard. But you can see the pavilion where you could watch golfers, probably some caddy shacks right here, or places, a pro shop to keep um, extra clubs. Then you have the clubhouse over to the right. So people could just drive right up. There were, there were two roads that you could just drive right up to the clubhouse through the course. Um, and here's another picture, not very interesting, but. All right, we reached the next age of Waveland's development and that's the golden age. Um, this is a, a famous hole in Wisconsin, um, kind of exemplifies what golden age architecture in golf looks like. Um, so I, I call the gold, I, I would date the golden age between about 1915 and then start of World War II. Um, most famous courses you've heard of are from the golden age, Augusta National, Pebble Beach. Um, I have a few more up there. And then we have Iowa examples of golden age courses, Wakanda, on the south side of Des Moines, Davenport, Cedar Rapids, and then Iowa State. It's called Vinker Memorial Golf Course today at Iowa State. And then these are the architects that worked on um, those various courses. An interesting thing in this time period is these are all professionals now. So whereas we go back a period, these, are, these courses are laid out by amateurs. It's becoming a professional business now. So they're, they're men who travel with teams and um, run construction companies to build courses, which is a big change from the time period before. Like I said, professionally designed, um, strategic options, the game becomes more detailed and strategic and that hitting it in different spots now have certain risk rewards. Um, this is a hole in Kansas and you can tell it has a different level of artistry than the first pictures we were looking at at Waveland. Um, I think we covered most of them. Yeah, and you can see they've made huge strides in how they shape and contour the land. Um, to get the, the greens to have that kind of role and, and contour takes someone who knows what they're doing. Um, whereas the early Waveland greens were probably just cut into the pasture circles. These are being manufactured, some of them to look um, natural, some of them not, but. Uh, here are a few more pictures of Golden Age courses. You can jump through these. Um, I just wanted to explain what a strategic hole means in this era. Um, this is a famous hole in, in Los Angeles at Riviera. And we call it strategic because the green has a very specific angle it's set at. So the golfer can choose, hey, I want to I wanna drive my ball here to get the angle. Or maybe they want to get greedy and they miss their spot. And now they don't have the angle. So the, the game is, the architecture has become more detailed and more interesting in that you can, you can hit it in the right spot, you can hit it in the wrong spot. Um, and that'll be important for Waveland's next evolution. Um, so why did golf, why was there a golf boom in this era? Um, economy was strong. Um, 
it was really easy to borrow money to build courses and pay people in this period. Um, golfers are getting a lot better and the, the tools you play golf with were getting more streamlined and um, more consistent. So the golf, the level of golf being played was much higher. So I'm gonna read a little excerpt from, um, you know what, I'm gonna skip that actually. Um, it's my belief that Waveland, there were calls to change Waveland around 1930 because you had these other golf courses um, in Iowa that really took the bar up in terms of, these were really well designed, really well thought of, and they were attracting big tournaments. So you had these country clubs um, getting a lot of attention. And I think people playing Waveland felt that their course was falling behind. So um, you start to see um, hints that the city is considering changing Waveland to meet those, the higher bar that's been set. Um, keep going here. And what I mean, um, okay, the biggest issue with these Victorian courses, like I said, the balls were getting better, the clubs, the links of holes no longer fit the golf that was being played. So this is some holes over at Grandview on the east side that hasn't been changed since 1902. And the problem is you have people teeing off and their ball might get here on a par four. And then the next group has to wait until they, they clear the green because you can almost drive a par four. So what you have is golfers stacking up on the tees, waiting, waiting for the, the golfers to get out of the way because the holes are so short. Um, and at Grandview, you have hole after hole of that distance. So there, there gets to be a lot of congestion. And that was, I think that was the biggest complaint people had about the early Waveland golf course. So here are some clippings from the, uh, these are Des Moines Register. Um, an, uh, a designer is floated. You, you start seeing his name um, in the papers around 1932 or 1931. Um, a Paul Coates, his name's Paul Coates and he's being considered to change the course. Um, he, I'll keep going here. Um, it's the depression, so you have these new, uh, new deal agencies that have, are making big loans to municipalities. Uh, and Waveland takes advantage of that. Um, And they, they hire this, this Coates guy from Minnesota, and I'll get to him more, but essentially um, the WPA program hires 200 men that are gonna build Waveland. Um, I showed you the picture early, earlier in the uh, presentation, but that money go just goes to paying those men to build the course, and that's, that's how the city gets it done. Um, because before that, they really didn't have any money to improve the golf course. Um, Paul Coates is the architect at this era. Um, he was an engineer from Minnesota. Um, he has some good designs in Minnesota and he was also here to help grade the airport, which is interesting. Um, so it seems like, I don't know whether golf was his first business interest or whether it was to make money, um, building the airport. I'm not sure, but, um, most people in the business think that he was competent. He wasn't a big name or a great architect, but he was definitely competent. Here are a few pictures of construction. Um, this is actually a movable lumber mill, portable sawmill. Um, cutting down some trees. They leveled some fairways. Um, and I think all they're using is mules and a blade to make these um, make these earth changes and to shape the earth. I don't think they had any um, technology beyond that. They had some trucks, as you can see in this picture, but definitely no bulldozers yet. Um, workers go on strike. 
while building Waveland, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, they were promised a certain number of hours and they didn't get it, so they walked off the job. And the, the course takes a long time to build. They start in 1930, I think in 34, and they're not done until 1938. The course, or 37, the course doesn't open. So here's that first picture we looked at. Um, you can see it's just teams of men with wheelbarrows. Um, I think what they're doing here is working on drainage down to that big pond, um, but it's hard to know. Here's another picture of them building the pond or enlarging the pond. So the clubhouse today sits up here. This would be the 18th green today. All right, so what does Coates produce? Um, this is his design for Waveland, most of which is there today. So when you go play Waveland, you're playing mostly Coates' course. Um, this is a diagram I found in the register and pretty well matches what you see. This is an aerial photo taken in the 50s. Um, so you can see his, his design was realized. I mean, the holes he laid out were constructed. Um, notably today, 15th hole is the same. It slithers down the eastern side of the course. Um, yeah, most of the bones for the course are a product of 1932 in this design. Just another diagram. I, I put the green holes are basically exactly what he designed. The red holes no longer exist, or the red holes today were not Coates' design. And the, the blue lines are edited Coates holes. So um, together, the, the blue and the green show you that most of the course is still his. And they get a new clubhouse built. It's a Tudor style um, clubhouse. I'm not sure, I think it was 38, um, but they were definitely very proud of this because this was a, a stately clubhouse for a municipality. Um, I think I'm gonna skip this for time, but it's a newspaper clipping where um, this sports writer is just kind of nostalgically talking about the course the course um, flipping over or um, the new course being opened and he laments he laments the old course before uh, the changes were made um, here's another picture of playing up toward the observatory so this is this hole still exists it has a lot more trees on it but this is the 11th hole today playing uh, west with the observatory out to the right. All right, so in this era, what happens? Waveland gets longer. The holes get significantly longer. I think the total yardage was around 5,000 before this plan, 5,000 yards long. And after the plan, it's about 6,400 yards. So it gets a lot longer. Um, if you think about playing golf, sometimes your, your ball is near the horizon. So the early course, a lot of those holes were east to west, which is a problem because early in the morning, you're hitting into the sun, you can't see it. Late in the day, you're hitting into the sun, you can't see it. So something that happened was north-south holes, many more north-south holes after Coates worked on it. And that's probably to get out of the sun for those early golfers and late golfers. Um, there's a great variety of holes that he comes up with. Short, long, turning left, turning right. Um, works with the land pretty well. Instead of playing um, up and over hills, Coates, in my opinion, goes through valleys more, uh, the natural valleys that are present at Waveland. So I think the walk is actually, or the course he built, the walk wasn't that bad. I think it's gotten worse over time, uh, more strenuous over time. And as we saw in those pictures, there's a ton of width, meaning the fairways are really wide and we can kind of see it there. 
Waveland's known for being a very tree golf course today. That's not how he designed it. It was, it was very open. Um, so we can skip this. Oh, this is a, this is a green that doesn't exist anymore. Um, so in the golden age of golf, there's this template hole or a repeated hole you see over and over, um, a punch bowl. So it's, it's just a fun way to see, um, see the ball collect on a green. It's a, uh, it creates diversity in the round. If you have a lot of greens that are sloping away and then you get to one where everything feeds into the same spot, it's a nice change of pace. So there was a punch bowl hole at Waveland. Um, you can kind of see the three here was the third hole back then, now it's the 12th, um, and the green is over here. But they did have a punch bowl, and you can, there's a, here's a picture of them building it. So they, they cored out a hillside and made a big bowl into it, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, it's still a walking game at this point. Um, so this is a bridge that was built between today's 14th and 15th holes. Um, then I found another picture of it in the 70s. It was still there, but it's not there today. Now there's just a cart path that goes down, down the valley and back up. Um, I consider Waveland a golden age adjacent course. It's not a masterwork as far as golf courses in general. Um, some characteristics of golden age courses, strategic options. There was some of that in Coates's design. Definitely a natural walk, which correlates with golden age courses. But really where it differs is the land shaping. I found no evidence that really skilled professionals were contouring and shaping the greens, building. I couldn't find any evidence of bunkers. Um, I just don't think it was very refined. I think it was those New Deal um, workers kind of figuring out on the fly how to build a course. And yeah, that's, that's where it differs from other golden age classic courses. Um, so this is the final era that I think we're still in at Waveland and that's post construction of 235. Um, that completely changed the golf course. Um, so I call that the post-war post -war era or the modern era of Waveland. Um, cultural forces at this time, it's baby boom. Everyone wants to play golf. The war is over. People want to live a good, good life. And a ton of golf courses are getting built and quickly. Um, so I, I did a little survey of just courses built in the Des Moines metro area between 1950 and 2000. And I found 19. So that's, I think at 20, every 26, 27 months, there's a new golf course in that time period, which kind of shows you how quickly they were going up. Um, yeah, I think all of these are still, there might be one or two that are no longer, but um, I think these are all still in operation. This era is also about TV. Um, you can watch the Masters now on TV, and that changes everything because country club members, the general golfing public, think that a, a course should be emerald green, and that it should be refined, and it should be perfect. And that's not really how golf was before then. Um, but this changes how courses are built, and eventually is going to change Waveland. Um, the the business changes in that it doesn't matter necessarily if you're building a great golf hole but can you get it green really easily and can you maintain it really easily um so the um the goal of a, a golf course architect in this era changes it's about building a course quickly because there's a lot of business and it's about making something that's practical um they kind of scoffed at the golden age courses and said well they're artistic and they're interesting, but we can't make money like that. Um, and they were looking to put up courses quickly. So that's the era we're in now, or that's the era that began in the 50s, I would say.
And here's a picture of Augusta, which it's unrealistic for most courses to look like that. Um, so it's decided that the freeway is coming through and the easiest way to get through this part of Des Moines is to cut through the golf course because you won't have to use eminent domain. There won't be angry homeowners. Um, there might be, but um, you can see in this picture, this is the old Waveland layout that Coates put down in 32. And you can see the freeway is gonna snip about 23 acres out the south of the golf course. Um, So um, the architect they choose to do the work is named Larry Packard. Um, and he's in town for two reasons. He's going to build a course that's called Blank Golf Course on the south side of Des Moines. And he has a country club lined up on the south side called Echo Valley. So he's already in town. They figure, why don't we just have him fix this Waveland issue? Because three of our holes are going to be gone. Um, I call it his side gig. I don't, I don't think this was the reason he was in Des Moines, but he got the job at Wayland. A little bit about him. He built 200 courses, around 200 courses. He was based in Illinois. Um, he's respected, but um, his courses tend to look the same. Uh, he was building a lot of courses at the probably 20 or 30 a year at his high point. So it's kind of a cut and paste. Um, how can we quickly build this? Um, so his job, he has a very difficult job. It's how do you cheaply fix this problem? You have the interstate cutting through these holes. How do you cheaply reconstruct the course? Because we still want to have 18 holes. Um, so they have, a, they have a lot of cash to do the work. They don't use most of it, which is, I don't know why. I think the, the city kept a lot of the money they got from the highway commission when they bought the land. Um, there was an earlier article about, before Coates came, um, someone had written into the register and said, I'm glad they're not taking half measures and they're bringing in someone to redo the course. But it's really clear in this era that you're gonna take a half measure because um, we gotta fix this problem and we, we wanna do it cheaply. And I think I'm gonna get to this next slide. Yeah, they wanna keep as many of the holes as possible, which it's really difficult to do because once you change one golf hole, it tends to affect the whole, the whole golf course. Um, so when you move around a tee or you change one thing it ends up, there's a chain reaction and it changes maybe six holes and you, you thought you were just changing one. Um, so he keeps 12 of Coates' holes. Um, he goes into this corner of the course that hadn't been used that was called picnic grounds originally, originally when we looked at it earlier. Um, and he kind of forces three golf holes onto that land. Um, and he adds bunkers, and I'm not sure why, because it's really expensive to maintain bunkers. But. So what he does, here's Coates' course. Interstate's gonna chop this off, essentially. So if you look at the aerial and think, well, where are we gonna, where are we gonna find three golf holes on a smaller property? Well, the woods. So that's his strategy. It's, it's take, take three holes from down here and try to force them into the, it's a very severe wooded area. Um, and they did. So they built today's second, third, and fourth holes into this um, forested area. It also has a really big creek in it. And the hillsides there are very, very, very steep. So this is probably getting a little bit too detailed, but here's another topographical map of just the second green. Um, and you can see there was a natural hillside here that they, they kind of just cut a flat spot into. Um, and that's how, they, that's how they built in this pretty severe forest was we're gonna find 
we're going to measure how far we want this hole to be, and we're just going to make a cut into the hillside. Um, and that was their strategy for building those three holes. Um, the issue is this changes the course dramatically. Um, you now are traversing the most up and down area of the course. Um, and you're playing through very tight spaces into wet, wet areas. So it's hard to grow grass. It's hard to walk. Um, changes the course a lot. Um, and the way they market these changes are that Waveland's getting tougher, which is also strange because it's a municipal golf course that's supposed to introduce people to the game. Um, here's an article where they're talking about hoard your balls because you're going to lose them all now, which is a, it's a very strange, I mean, it was marketed as very tough at that time, but you're telling people you're going to struggle before they even get out there, which is an interesting strategy. Um, they flipped the nines in the 70s because they want to sell more beer. Um, so you had, well, I'll try to find a, a photo here. You had, uh, let's see. That might not do it, but we'll try. Sorry about the waiting. Anyway, they flip the nine so you have to cross the clubhouse after nine holes. So you can stop and buy more drinks. So it used to be you played, uh, you played the ninth hole and then went to the tenth hole. And then you, you went around the back nine and you finished on 18. I guess they weren't making enough money, so they, they flip the nine. So now you start here. This is your ninth hole. And you cross the clubhouse and play 10 which isn't, isn't a bad change, but it's significant because um, you talk about the holes you know, and this just flips the order um, of the nines. So we can recap this era. More Americans want to play golf. Um, like I said, 19 new courses in the metro alone. Um, Waveland gets whittled away by the new interstate. Um, I didn't really touch on this, but I could more. Um, the business of running the course changes. It's, today, the money is made renting carts. Um, so a lot of the improvements for the course actually go into to pavement. Um, they don't actually go into the golf. Um, and that's a big change that's happened in the industry. It's not necessarily Waveland, but um, the golf, in my mind, is kind of taking a back seat to selling beer and renting carts. Um, so if we compare, we compare the golf course to Victorian iteration or the Golden Age iteration, in my mind, it's less about exercise. We talked about, I mean, Victorian golfers wanted to get out in fresh air and go exercise. I don't think that's the case anymore. I think it's, we want to go drive the golf carts around. Um, that was more people involved. It gets more people true, through. It gets true. more people through when they have a car. Yeah, true. Um, which is what the golf course wants. But the priorities when it was built was exercise. Right. So, yeah. Um, and then I think it's significant that Waveland might get some of its biggest use days in the, in the winter when people are sledding, skiing. And as we looked at the first iteration of the course, you had an open park picnic area. And there was this idea that you were at the park, maybe you play golf. Now no one in the summers, all they're doing is playing golf. So in my mind, it's become a little bit more closed off. Um, I want to read one more thing to end on a more positive note. This is a little history that I wrote about Waveland, and this is the final section. And I call Waveland the quint quintessential Iowa golf course because if you figure 50,000 people play it a year, 
50,000 rounds over a hundred years, it's, it's gotten 5 million rounds. I can't imagine any course in Iowa getting that many. So it really is the quintessential golf experience for our state. Um, so Waveland is still one of the most popular courses in Iowa. Its tradition is supported by a strong contingent of men's, and men's league and women's leagues, local universities, Des Moines public schools, and a faithful clientele. Waveland's layout has changed marginally since 1970, and many of the issues that Packard instituted, um, uh, sorry, many of the persistent issues the course faces today were caused by the Packard redesign in I-235. Um, despite these challenges, it's a beloved golf course. It's a foundational green park in the middle of a city, um, and it's a leading institution for golf in the state. So that's all I have. Thank you. Um, that's not quite clear, but I think I think at Waveland's opening. I think it was always um, men and women playing golf at Waveland. Um, yeah. Switch it to this slide. Um, yeah. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you very much. No problem. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, next month, uh, the next Iowa Files will be on Sunday, November 20th. Between 1854 and 1929, approximately 200,000 children were taken from cities such as New York and Boston, put on trains, and brought out to the Midwest to be adopted. Sometimes that went well, oftentimes it did not. So historian Carol Bonesteiner will be here to talk about history and the repercussions of the orphan trains. So thank you again for coming today, and we'll see you next month. Thanks. Uh,